It is so nice just to be in this building together with all of you and to worship together. So thank you for coming, especially on such a, well, shall we say an unsunny day. Uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, this morning, I pray that you would make us one in spirit, those who are uh, joining us in the online realm and those of us uh, seated, here in, seated here in person. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would make us one in heart and mind and that at this moment we would turn our eyes to see you enthroned in our midst. Lord Jesus, we gather together with gratitude for every blessing that you have given us. And Lord, we also gather um, with brokenness, uh, knowing the places in our hearts and our souls that are yet unhealed, yet untouched, and holding in prayer those in our lives who are lost or broken, in our eyes, perhaps uh, broken uh, beyond repair, but in your eyes, Lord, uh, nothing holds that definition. So Lord, I pray during the service that you would give us your eyes, um, give us hope, uh, give us your, your peace and your blessing. And Lord, I pray that through the course of this service, our eyes would see your kingdom more and more clearly among us, and that we would leave this place with a, a greater measure of joy than when we came in. Come, Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit and anoint this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we present ourselves before you again this Sunday. Mass murders continue in America. Geopolitical tensions increase around the world. Justice remains precarious. While the virus rages on fighting for dominance in its involuntary way, we are fighting about treatments and truth and researchers scramble to keep up 
though jobs are returning, so many of us have been altered by job loss and disorientation, anxiety and depression are rising. Where is our hope? Where is our future? We question and guesstimate and worry. Turn our eyes to you again, Jesus, to your cross where you absorbed all conflict, to your resurrection, which confirmed your triumph, to your reign in power at the right hand of our Father. You are love, dear Father God. Propositional truth may be hard to discern, but love and truth meet in your tender-hearted commitment to make us into the image of Jesus. We will never give up looking to you. There is always more growth and hope and the best to live together in peace. Your family of redeemed image bearers is yet to be, amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There are salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, all sin is gone. This is my story, this is my song. I forgot I was doing the reading this morning, so give me a second. Okay. Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 17. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I thought in my heart, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. I'm going to take my mask off for the sermon, but remind me to put it back on when I'm done, if I forget. Before we get into the sermon, a couple of things I wanted to mention. One, you may note the, uh, the oh, children are dismissed. Jason, you're not the only one who forgets important items in the service. <laughs> Um, somebody already noted that it looks a little bit like Superman's city in the glass bottle, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but it is actually a seed nursery. Uh, it only be there for a couple of weeks, right, ladies? Is that, yeah, just for a short while. But um, they asked if that could be kept there for now. And I have to say, I can think of really no better metaphor for a, a church sanctuary than a, a seedling nursery of things waiting to bloom and waiting to grow. Uh, things that are yet to come, as Karen uh, reminded us of in, in her uh, reading. The other thing I wanted to mention, because uh, it, it, I, I didn't know it until this morning, or I had forgotten it, but this is actually a very important day for me personally as your pastor, so if you'll indulge me in what I hope is not narcissism, but hopefully a sharing that will mean something to you as it does to me. Um, uh, on this day, 30 years ago to the day, uh, I was struck by lightning out in the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, my boat was struck by lightning. I was just a couple of feet from it. And, um, and we began to sink in, in stormy waters. <laughs> that was a moment for me, as you might imagine. Uh, it my, remains my best story to tell. And I'm not going to tell the whole thing right now because that would take the, the remainder of the time. Uh, but this is uh, a significant uh, day for me, and I got a text from my mother who was with me at that time. Um, something occurred to me, I'll tell you a little bit of the story, because I, it said, you know, it was, as I said, it was significant in my life and um, had some long-term effects on me. Uh, Jerry's got it worse, but we'll, <laughs> we'll share, share that some other time. Um, but... Um, it blew up the boat. Uh, everywhere that metal came down from the mast, every, all the stays and everything, everything that touched the surface of the boat blew up. And so there were, you know, 30, 40 holes all throughout the, the 60 foot trimaran. And we immediately began to take on water and go down. There was smoke everywhere too. Um, and there were a number of miracles that happened. I, I don't have time to go with them all, but it knocked me unconscious first. And when I woke, there was, uh, as I said, smoke everywhere. And we were worried that we were on fire. Um, but the amazing thing was, so, you know, we couldn't use the sails because all, all, everything had been blown to, to bits. And uh, if you don't have sails, and you don't have a motor out at sea, thousands of miles from any Coast Guard, you're, you're in big trouble. Everything in that boat blew up um, except the batteries, which is something that we don't fully understand because the batteries are connected to everything else and they're batteries. <laughs> um, but for reasons quite beyond our understanding, we were able to get the engine running. Uh, it, you know, it takes batteries to start an engine, and we, everything else in that boat was destroyed. Um, and, and that was uh, something we still can't wrap our heads quite around, but it helped us get into port. But something happened some years later. So 
one of the interesting things about when you're surrounded by that much energy, electrical explosion, is that cassette tapes, audio cassette tapes, uh, get erased because the polarization of the magnetic field, I don't even understand. I don't know. Cassette tapes get erased. Um, and I had 10 cassette tapes in a little stereo boom box and thing. I listened to those. I, you know, we didn't have anything. That was my entertainment. I listened to those tapes over and over and over again. And a few minutes before we got hit by lightning, I was listening to one of these tapes, and it was one of my favorite ones, which was the Joshua Tree uh, by, by uh, U2. And, uh, and I, of course, I couldn't listen to that tape again after the lightning strike. And I didn't, I, you know, this was before YouTube and everything, and I didn't ha have money for a CD. I didn't listen to that album again. Uh, no, and years later, I was sitting in an Espresso Royale coffee shop, um, and you buy, and the song came on over the speakers, and it was running to stand still, and my and I got sweaty and started shaking, and I got and I was I was it was like a PTSD moment. And I realized that minutes before I got hit by lightning, I've been listening to that very song, and kind of yeah. And, my, and for actually, it was kind of fun. It was like pressing a bruise. I could listen to that song, and I just start to get sh shaky and nervous. I sort of did it for kicks. <laughs> Um, like, and then it gradually it wore off and now I can listen to it and it doesn't have that uh, effect, but it was fun for a bit. Anyway, my point was that song, at the end of the song are these lyrics. Uh, it's a song about heroin addiction and the very end of it is, she is raging, she is raging and the storm blows up in her eyes. She will suffer the needle chill. She's running to stand still. And so, Running to stand still, I think, is a, first of all, it's a great phrase, but that's really what I was doing in my life at that time was running to stand still. And I was surrounded by people. We were in, in the boat community, the sailing community, uh, sailing. You know, there are all kinds of sailors out there. Almost all of them are running to stand still. Most people out there who are sailing for, for life, uh, yachts as they're called, are running from something. Uh, inner demons. Uh, you know, addictions, some of them are actually literally running, uh, drug runners, smugglers, um, everybody's running. My own, my stepfather at the time, the man uh, who was on the boat with us, um, was running from any number of things. He, he was not a happy man. He had circumnavigated the globe three times already in his boat. And the thing about circumnavigating the, the globe is it's round, <laughs> and you end up right where you started every time. He couldn't run away. And so many people are running to stand still. And I was too, running nowhere. And um, I think about that lightning strike and what it, the path it set us on. And uh, that when I finally came to a place where I realized I wasn't running anywhere and the Lord reached out and said, there is a place to run to and a race you can run that has an end. Um, I, that, that was a, a moment of, of well, it was a lightning strike for me of a whole different kind. So I just share that with you, some thoughts about that. And uh, if you're lucky, some, someday I'll share that full story with you. And then you will know I have no other stories because that is my best one. After that, it's all middle-aged remodeling kitchens and things. And it's just not very interesting. <laughs> all right. We are going to be talking about, well, not just talking about, but we're going to start talking about something that I don't even really have a good word for yet, uh, which is outreach or evangelism or, uh, you know, like I said, I, I don't really like any of the words we have for it. So we're going to be talking about reaching out to other people with the gospel, with the good news. Um, and my hope and my prayer is that over the next year, two, three, four, five years, years, um, that we will not, we will talk about it, we will study it, in fact, uh, have classes on it, but that we won't just talk about it. <laughs> There's plenty of talking. Um, you know, I, I do lots of it, actually, and I, I concur with you that sometimes I get tired of my own voice. <laughs> But we do need to talk about it. We do need to look at God's word with regard to it. But I'd really like to do it. Success or failure is not really in mind here. It's not in view here for me. But to, to do it prayerfully with the leading of the Holy Spirit 
and with love in our hearts, uh, not a bid for power or a bid for influence or a bid for control, but with love to reach out with the gospel to our community, our friends and our neighbors, but also our community here where the where Lord has placed this, this fellowship. So we're going to start um, with that, with uh, talking about um, Stephen and then Philip, who's known colloquially in church history as Philip the Evangelist. But we're going to start with Stephen uh, today, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. If you can put up that first slide there for me, Elizabeth. Thank you. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So just to give some context, um, this is shortly after Pentecost. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the church and people are coming to the church in droves. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, I'm sure I slaughtered a couple of those names, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Um, So there's a problem in the church. Now, the first thing I want to say is that in God's kingdom, I know this sounds like a cheap saying, but bear with me. In God's kingdom, every problem is an opportunity. I don't mean just problems in the church. I mean even our deep personal problems, all the problems we have on this green earth. And this is a reality of walking with the Lord that I think perhaps the early church understood better than, than we do today in North America. Uh, Paul is my favorite and most easy example of this. You know, just, just walk through Paul through his mission field in the Mediterranean. You know, if he's put in prison, well, that's an opportunity to witness to the Praetorian Guard. Uh, if he's beaten, it's an opportunity to join Christ in his sufferings and to learn humility, to embrace humility. And even though we don't have a record of it, presumably, uh, knowing his character and his faith, that when Paul is killed, it's an opportunity to show how a person of faith can die with hope and indeed expectant joy. So every trial and tribulation is an opportunity to show how God works in our lives and how we stand apart, and we do stand apart and should stand apart from the normative cycles of this world of greed, of revenge, of self absorption of violence, of lust, of apathy, and so forth, that, that, that it's an opportunity for us to show God's grace and mercy. So here's a problem, it's sort of a couple problems. And it's a problem that started, I would guess, as nothing more than kind of an irritant and, and grew. So two problems. One, the leaders of the church were, their, their time was getting nickeled and dimed to death. Um, by the practical responsibilities of church leadership. This is a, a story as old as the hills. And, and you know, a lot of us uh, might remember the story of Moses and his father-in-law and his father-in-law telling him, you can't do everything, Moses. And Moses being like, oh yeah, that's right. And sometimes people need to hear that, that not just in church, but other places, you, can't, you need help. You can't do everything. So this is the first part of the problem. They wanted to free up some time. The apostles are busy mostly preaching and teaching. Uh, as I said, since Pentecost, thousands of people have become Christians in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And by the way, when lots of people join the church, or when anybody joins the church, conflict is as inevitable as night following day. That's just a, it's a Pythagorean theorem of church life. 
you will have conflict. And one of the conflicts, as we read about, has to do with food not being distributed fairly uh, in the church, to, particularly to the poor of the church. And that was the other problem. And we can assume that it was not intentional. We should assume it was not intentional. And the Greek word that they use here means to look past, just like our word overlook. Um, overlook can be accidental or intentional, but in this context, it most assuredly was not a purposeful thing done by the apostles. So why did it happen? Why were the Hellenistic uh, Jewish widows and presumably other impoverished people overlooked in the food distribution? Well, of course, this is before the time of cell phones and computers and all this stuff. And, you know, communication was a lot more difficult. And the apostles were not Hellenistic Jews. They were not Gentile Greek speakers. They were Jewish, ethnically Jewish, um, you know, Hebraic Jews. Uh, they spoke Aramaic. They're the ones who gathered the tithes. They're the ones who purchased the food and, and gave it away. So they knew the Jewish people in Jerusalem. That's their families. That's their friends. That's the neighborhood they grew up in. They're just not very familiar with the Hellenistic Jewish families and people. And so, of course, it's easier to neglect folks that you don't know very well or, or don't have much contact with. And it seems that the church as a whole, the people of the congregation of Jerusalem, felt that this was indeed the issue, that they just didn't know them, because the seven men that they selected all have non-Jewish names. So these are all Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking uh, Jewish people, uh, converts to Judaism, and then uh, converts to, to, well, Jewish people who believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This is even before the term Christianity was coined. Okay, so simple enough, even a little dull, especially on a rainy day like this. Okay, problem solved, conflict ended, the apostles are free to tend to their calling. Well, not so fast. You look a little more carefully. Now, no one is 100% immune from pride. So don't think of me as throwing stones here. No one's 100% immune from pride. And the apostles were just ordinary men, very ordinary. In fact, they were largely uneducated and rather insignificant for most of their lives in, in terms of, of historical proceedings. And now thousands of people, literally thousands of people, were coming to the Lord through their ministry. God was using them to enact the most amazing of miracles. This was an outpouring of the Spirit such as not been seen since. And this all happened in a very short, compressed span of time, a couple years at most, probably not even that, uh, since Pentecost. And it was probably difficult for them to not think more highly of themselves than they ought. I can tell you I would have struggled with that too. It just, it'd be hard for all of us if you're being honest. And their comment, it, which, uh, about in the middle of that passage there, their comment, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables is telling. Even in English, that doesn't sound very, it's like, a bit of a, <laughs> it's a little pride. And the fair distribution of food in the church is more than just waiting on tables. I mean, that's really, I mean, it, that's a, a serious issue. And it's true, I agree. I think they were wise to delegate this task. You know, I, they really couldn't do everything. So of course they should delegate it. But I don't think at this point they fully yet understood the nature of the body of Christ. Uh, later, Peter in his letter would talk about the priesthood of believers, the priesthood of believers. But I don't think he's quite grasped it yet. Right now, they're still taking a laity versus priests view of the church. Um, those who do sort of the more sophisticated outreach type work and those who do the more practical work. Um, priest versus the laity, you know, and why wouldn't they think that way? I mean, these are, these are Jewish men in the Jewish tradition, the Jewish faith. They're, they're priests, right? They're priests who are educated, who are trained in the temple, and they intercede uh, for us on behalf, of, uh, uh, on behalf of us for God at the altar. I mean, it, that's, it makes sense, you know, to think that way. The apostles are the new priests. The laity will tend to the practical matters of the church, and there is a hint of pride here. We are the ones who do the most important work. We are the evangelists and teachers and so on. 
So the Lord has a lesson here for Peter and John and the rest of the apostles. And I think for us today, the church as a whole, about what it means to be the church, what it means to be the body of Christ, each of you here and me and everyone who's with us <laughs> online and otherwise. So follow with me now. Some trustworthy people are needed to do a fairly mundane task, a lot food, right? Like our food pantry. Not an unimportant task, right? But mundane, I would say, not flashy, um, not impressive necessarily. They're gonna divide up food fairly. And seven men are picked. Interestingly, seven men are picked not by the apostles, but the apostles say, you all do it. You pick the people you think are best and we'll appoint them to the, to the task. I mean, there's sort of a power sharing balance here, but they're picked by the, by the church. These are the people we trust the most to do this. The apostles pray for them and they're done. You can imagine the apostles thinking, okay, that's fixed. We'll get on with it. And we'll reach others with the gospel. And that was their whole reason to do this, that you do this, this mundane task and I will reach people with the gospel. But now the scene changes. And I've, I've mentioned this before. It's helpful to me. Maybe it's helpful to some of you. When you read the Bible, I think of it sometimes like a director. I think of the Holy Spirit as a director pointing his camera at different scenes. And in a movie, the director films the most important scenes that are happening. Other things might happen in the script or be alluded to in the script. Other things might happen off camera, but the most important things are on the screen there in front of you. And the director makes those decisions. So once this event is done, you expect the camera to go back to Peter and John and, or some other apostle on their ministry, their outreach, their, or their persecution. That's where you expect the camera to go, right? Well, it doesn't. This is the very next verse. Now, Stephen. Who's Stephen again? Don't forget, Stephen is the man picked to divide up bread for the poor. That's what they prayed for him for. That was his job. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene, Alexandria, etc. And they began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Now, Luke in Acts doesn't draw this out explicitly, but this is a, uh, a sea change. This is something new. This has never been seen before. In the past, it was always the apostles doing this kind of work. In fact, if you read in Acts 4, just a couple chapters before, um, you know, in verse 33, uh, the church shared all their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. Some of you are probably familiar with that verse. And then with great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So the believers are sharing everything and they're, they're living in community, but it's the apostles who with great power testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Stephen is the first person in the early church, at least recorded in, in the Bible, to be doing the work of an apostle, but is not an apostle. He was not one of the twelve but he was doing their work. And the director, the Holy Spirit, suddenly shifts to Stephen. The apostles were supposed to be freed up, but it's Stephen who's doing the work all of a sudden. There's no mention that Stephen stopped being in charge of allocating food or that he neglected his duties or anything like that. One presumes he did those things. It just says that he was full of grace and power and was doing mighty works. As a pastor, it's kind of easy to see how this could happen. He was selected because people could see he had a strong faith and he was trusted. He was full of God's mercy, God's grace. And what they do with him? Well, they sent him to the houses of the poor throughout Jerusalem, to the widows' homes, to people who didn't have very much. And so he was going into the homes of the impoverished. And, and where do you find the greatest blessing of the Lord, the movement of the spirit? It's usually among the poor. So it's like they lit a fuse on him in a sense. And of course, the, these people are going to ask uh, Stephen to pray with them and for them and to minister to them and with them and all these things. And, and his ministry just takes off.
So God blessed Stephen and answered his prayers, this food divider person, this waiter of tables. He worked through Stephen and gave him the kind of grace and power that before only the 12 had. Stephen was selected to be a food pantry administrator, and the Lord made him a healer, an evangelist, a preacher, and most famously to us, a martyr. That's who the Lord made him. And I think that God was revealing to us what a priesthood of believers really looks like. Peter got it in the end. In a priesthood of believers, we all have our roles and our jobs and things need to be done, teaching and, I don't know, gardens, vacuuming, I mean, you know, the list of things that have to be done. But we're a priesthood of believers, and the Lord will select whom the Lord will select to accomplish his purposes. At any given time, we are all potential witnesses, potential teachers, potential healers. The Lord will use whom the Lord will use. And I hope you can see now why I'm starting with this as a sermon for outreach, that this is not my job. It's not the deacon's job, or at least it's not just our job. It's all of us together doing it, being open to it. And I really believe unless we take that view, we're hobbling ourselves. And the kind of people these Stephen types, the type of people who stand up in the church and say, you know, I'll clean up that mess, or I'll put away the chairs, you know, I'll mow the lawn, I'll handle the money, I'll, you know, so on and so forth, are often the same people that when the Lord calls say, here I am, I am here, Lord. When it comes to reaching out to people with God's love, there just aren't any experts. There just aren't. You know, I've spent a lot of money and I've spent a lot of time trying to learn the Bible as best as I can. I, I would blush to call myself an expert because I know too many people <laughs> who are better at it than I am, but I've spent my life studying it. I know something of it, but I'm not an expert at outreach. I'm just not. And I, I, we have to do it as, as a body. You know, I think sometimes in America, and I'm guilty of this as well, we've been seduced by expertise. We just, we've just been seduced by expertise. I'm not saying anything political. Lord knows I'm not dipping a toe into that snake-infested <laughs> waters of anything. I'm just talking, generally speaking, as, as people that we, well, because here in America in particular, in this prosperous and technologically, technologically advanced country, we are very good at many things. We can solve many problems. We can send rockets to the moon. And now I guess reusable rockets, which is just remarkable, but never mind. <laughs> can nerd out on that later. I mean, there isn't much we can't do, I feel like, when we all work together and apply ourselves through expertise. But the Holy Spirit, and indeed love, this quality of the Lord that he bequeaths to us, it's not a matter of expertise. It's a matter of sensitivity, of faith, of humility. It's not expertise, and we have to do away with that. In fact, well, let's just be honest. This, this past year has been a terrible year for experts in the church. Uh, probably most famously, the, the, the most, one of the most famous uh, apologetics evangelist, Ravi Zacharias, was shown to be leading a terrible double life um, to uh, migrate sadness and but I mean he, he was a sexual predator I mean really if you read the full summary of what came out it wasn't just like some affair I mean it was sexual predation he was an expert that should give us pause you know the Hillsong pastor and you're, you know just google clergy scandal in 2020 I could just and then see how you feel about experts. Um, I, you know, I just have little, little, very little faith left in expertise. So we start at the bottom rung with just humility and say, Lord, we can't do this without you. But you know, this early church and this, this 
this event with Stephen, so healthy in so many ways, so good in so many ways. I, when I read it and I reflect on it, I think, Lord, make us a church like that. You know, no one says to Stephen, that isn't what we commissioned you to do. You know, get back to doing what we prayed for you to do. You're supposed to be doing this other stuff. No, or at least if anybody said it, it's not recorded. What are you doing preaching and evangelizing? And Stephen didn't say to the apostles, hey, anyone can do this now. Look at how the Holy Spirit is blessing my ministry. I don't need you. I don't need your leadership. In fact, I can create my own group of followers. I'll create a, a denomination. I don't know what a denomination is, but I'll create one. <laughs> you know, I mean, but I mean, I'm joking a little bit, but you look at the history of the church. How many times does something like that happen? But none of that happens. You know, they, in fact, when you get on, we'll, next week we'll get on to, to Philip, and you see Peter and John working hard to support Philip's evangelism. And they laid hands on Philip and prayed for him to be a divider of bread. <laughs> but they just go where the spirit is leading. They just go where the spirit is leading. That's what they're going to support. So let's close out our story of Stephen here. And these folks uh, who, of course, anytime you have success, there's gonna be pushback. They secretly persuaded some men to say, we have hurt, well, hold on, I'll get the, we have, uh, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. We've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And what follows after that, I will not read. It's the longest sermon in, in the Bible. I mean, the longest sermon recorded in the Bible is Stephen's. Not, again, not Peter's or John's or Mark's or even Jesus. I mean, Stephen has this incredibly long sermon in Acts about the history of the Jewish people, whatnot. And then he accuses, he accuses his accusers at the very end of hypocrisy. And that's when they decide they've had enough. And at, the, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And meanwhile, Saul is there. The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. There's a man full of grace. And when he said this, he fell asleep, died. That is the life of Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church, at least written in the pages of scripture, was a man in charge of the food pantry and prayed for in that regard. That was him. And what an honor, I mean, not that I want to be thrown rocks at and killed in the middle of the city center, but he will always be known as the first martyr of the church for eternity, this man. He was a missionary, an evangelist, and a martyr. Because the Lord said, I'm going to make you a missionary, an evangelist, and a martyr. So as we reach out to people, However that looks, and believe me, I do not yet know how that's going to look, but it's going to look like something. <laughs> it's going to involve talking to people, finding ways to reach people in ways that are loving and humble and winsome. I, I need you guys to all be Stevens. Hopefully not quite with the same ending of the story, but if so, then with great joy. And I don't know where that's all going or what that means, but I really feel strongly the hand of the Lord leading to reaching out to people with the good news. And I think we're at a place now where we can, there's so many things that go, I, I've probably spoken for too long already, but I'll just end with this. 
I do feel like Cornerstone Fellowship is situated very well for this. Uh, there's a there's a verse in, in Acts as well where it talks about how they uh, the church won the favor of the people by just being the church, helping people, reaching out to people, praying for them, giving them what they need, helping them financially or with food or whatever. And we have favor in this community. Um, I probably know that better than most because as the pastor, I receive the most communiques of this regard. Where, but we have favor in this community. We've built favor. And there are people in this community who need Jesus like you wouldn't believe, wearing it on their sleeve. But we are, you know, even just uh, earlier this week, uh, Solo Gratia, the, the folks who have the, that huge uh, field, uh, the big garden out there, they came out here. Uh, Housing and Urban Development is going to build a, a, a blessing box, a mini food pantry out there. Um, where there, anyway, there's just there's things afoot. Our garden is fantastic. Thank you, ladies, for that. It's it's amazing. God's bless. Oh, and by the way, we're getting a new roof and new gutters and new. Uh, <laughs> yes, right. You can thank the insurance companies for that. Um, but just a lot of. A lot of things are happening that are good and positive and powerful. We're going to have more resources freed up at the end of the year as we get tax exempt status for our property. That's money we can do something with. That's money we can do outreach with. Any manner of things. A lot of practical stuff, but really our hearts have to be on board with this. And um, I know for many of you, you already are. <laughs> and I, if you, if you are the first you're hearing of it, just pray about it at home in your heart and pray as, as we move forward that we find a creative and loving way to reach out to people with the good news here. Amen. That, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the cornerstone. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, church. All right, we're going to move into our time of communion now. Um, since we're not doing communion here in the church, we're going to reflect on the cross and Jesus' sacrifice. Those on Zoom, of course, can take communion at home. Uh, would you pray with me? Uh, Lord Jesus, one of, the, one of the things that always just astounds me reading about your life in the Gospels and the things that I... Uh, I hope to follow in your footsteps, Lord, is how you always followed your Father's will. Every step you took, every word you spoke was a word in season, a word at the right time. Lord, may we follow your will in a like manner. May the Holy Spirit direct our steps. May we not do anything, speak any word out of any pride, out of any willfulness, but rather, may we come humbly before your throne and say, Lord, teach us what the next step is. And we are listening, Lord, and we will follow. Amen. Saints immortal reign, infinite day excludes the night, and pleasures banish pain. Your everlasting spring of ice, never withering flower, death like a narrow sea divide, this heavenly land from could we but climb where Moses stood and feel the landscape of not Jordan stream nor Descobar, just cry. 
guide us from this shore. Yes, sir. 